the most common question that I seem to continue to get since I've started my financial consulting with nonprofits is how to use QuickBooks to track restricted funds their balances, and their transactions. Well, in this three-part series, I'm tackling that question. If you missed the first one, go back and find part one. It's on how to set it up. Today, we're going to move into how to code those transactions. Hi, I'm Teresa Clark, and I'm a CPA with over 25 years worth of experiences serving 501c3 nonprofits. I've done that both inside and outside of the nonprofit organization, inside as a CFO and outside as an independent auditor, uh, auditing nonprofits. And so I've leveraged that years, those experiences and wisdom into the consulting practice that I now have serving nonprofits to help them answer their unique financial questions. You can kind of think of me as a strategic partner to help you master the money. You can learn more about me and visit my resources at TeresaClark.com. Okay, we're going to talk about how to code the transactions once you get um, the settings in QuickBooks where they need to be. So today I'm going to share my screen. And um, again, we're talking about restricted funds. So what is that? Well, generally accepted accounting principles, GAAP, require nonprofits to report their funds in two sections in the net asset of the um, statement of financial position. They are funds without restrictions, unrestricted funds, we'd often say, and funds with restrictions. And so today we're going to talk about after you've configured your QuickBooks to be able to handle that, how do you and where do you then record those transactions? So there's generally speaking three places that you're having transactions come in that you need to make sure you're using the class. Here we go. The first one is an expense, or if you're using the sort of accounts payable cycle of QuickBooks, you're using a bill setting, it's there that you need to record the class. Once you've toggled on the classes to be used in your settings, you're going to move over here. Here's a sample expense screen. And on the right side, you're now going to see a new field that's called class. You can click the pull down button and select from the classes that you have set up, or you can set them up on the fly when it's your first time to go through them. The next place that you're going to experience this is going to be on your deposit. So here's a sample bank deposit. Once again, very similarly on the right side, you're now seeing a class. You can click there, pull down, or add on the fly for the first time. Be very careful that um, after you've added them that you're using the list because it can be tricky um, if you just keep typing, you're going to end up with a bunch of them. And of course, there's a way to clean it up, but I sure recommend staying away from that if you possibly can. Um, I also, a real quick side note, would recommend here that when you do set up your classes, you if you have um, different years or things like that, try labeling them in a way that's consistent. So uh, just be mindful and plan ahead. However you enter things and how they show up on this dropdown are the columns that they're going to report on. And we'll visit that in our third part of our video series. Last place that I would say you might commonly bump into the need to record a class um, is in the journal entries. And so once again, here, you're going to see that the class field is now available on the right side of the journal entry screen. This one, I would hope is limited, rare, because um, transactions really at their source level is where you want to be coding them. A journal entry might be an indication that you've not done something where it came in and you're doing a lot of manual work in the cleanup. And it's just, you know, someone who has done a lot of this work, I can tell you, if you leave jobs to be done later, they get forgotten, especially when there's transition, somebody doesn't know to go back and do that. And it can really cause your restrictive fund balances to be incorrect. So I definitely recommend that you set those up um, at the transaction level or the expense and the deposit level so that they're broken down and recorded in their parts as they come in. All right. So like I said, this is a three-part series. This is video two, and I hope that this helps you to know where to record those transactions. Um, we're going to jump into the reporting side in a, the next video, so I look forward to seeing you there. In the meantime, if you have questions or you're feeling a little stuck and unsure, I just want to remind you that I'm available. You can jump on my website, TeresaClark.com, and schedule a strategic consult where we can talk about your unique situation. I'd love to help you.